So let's start with the first uh, concrete example. So we'll start with the first uh, kind of successful blockchain called the Bitcoin blockchain. And we'll see, let's see how that works. So in Bitcoin, basically, um, again, we have a, a blockchain, which is essentially a sequence of blocks. So here you see uh, block number, you know, n minus one is represented here. Block number n is represented here and so on and so forth. You see that every block has a certain set of transactions inside of it. So block n minus one has four transactions in it. Uh, block number n has also four transactions in it. So really, basically, you can see that the blockchain is basically maintaining a sequence of, of these blocks. Um, and there's a strong ordering and the blocks themselves are sorry, the transactions themselves are grouped into blocks um, so that every block contributes a new set of transactions into the blockchain. Now, uh, these things up here that uh, I refer to as the blocks, uh, well, those are actually called the block headers. Um, and in fact, they're quite short. A block header literally contains these four fields here, one field called a hash, another field called a timestamp, the transactions, and a nonce. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of uh, what these things are. I'll just tell you that sort of the transaction hash, hash is a very small value, uh, essentially 32 bytes of data. Uh, this transaction hash basically represents all the transactions that were added within a particular block. We'll see how that's done again in just a minute. Uh, and the reason we call it a chain is because all these block headers are chained together. So what do we mean by that? What we mean is essentially you take uh, the, all the data in block number n minus one, and again, you hash it into a short string, a 32 byte string, and that hash is written into the next block. Okay, so essentially we take block number n minus one, compress it using a hash function, and we write that into block number n. We write the resulting hash into block number n. So in some sense, block number n contains inside of it a representation of everything in block number n minus one, and because block number n minus one contain, contains inside of it a representation of block n minus two, sort of recursively, um, every block contains some sort of uh, uh, dependency on everything that came before it in the blockchain. Okay, so this is why um, there's a serial uh, 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 um, progression of blocks where essentially every block kind of depends on all previous blocks that came before it. So this is, again, specific to the blockchains. There are more recent designs of blockchains that, in fact, are not necessarily, a, there's not necessarily a strict ordering of blocks. But in the Bitcoin blockchain, in fact, there is such a strict ordering, and that actually defines a strict ordering of transactions that were added to the blockchain. So I promised you to explain uh, what a hash function is and what a hash is. So let's do that quickly, because this is going to be used a lot throughout uh, the lectures. Um, so what is a hash function? Basically, a hash function is basically, I'll denote it by H. And essentially, it's just a computable, efficiently computable function that takes arbitrary data as input and produces a 32-byte output. So you can imagine like gigabytes of data going in. Yeah, this could be literally gigabytes of data, and the hash function just produces 32 bytes as a result. Okay, so every time I refer to a hash value, what I mean is just 32 bytes of data that gets written into a particular field. All right, so that's what a hash function is. And hash functions can have a variety of properties. The property that's most common uh, is what's called uh, collision resistance, which means that it's difficult to find two distinct inputs that happen to map to the same output. In other words, it's kind of hard to find, you know, uh, data number one and data number two. Let's call it D1 and D2, so that if I hash this data and I hash data number two, I end up with the same two, uh, the same 32 bytes uh, uh, hash value as a result. Yeah, this would be a collision because uh, D1 and D2 happen to map to the same output. So if it's hard to find collisions, we say the hash function is collision resistant, and this is actually necessary for many of the things that we're going to be using hash functions for. Okay, good. Um, so in the Bitcoin blockchain, just to kind of be concrete, you can see that there are lots of blocks that have already been assembled. So in this slide, you see that uh, blocks sort of progress in time from the bottom to the top. So here's block number 540,855, 540,856, um, and so on and so forth. You can see that every block is added roughly, roughly every 10 minutes. This is the design of the Bitcoin network. In this case, there were actually two blocks added at the same time. But generally, there's a, there, uh, a, there's a new block that's added every 10 minutes. Uh, since the beginning of time, so since 2009, there's been a new block uh, added roughly every 10 minutes. You can see that every block 
contains about a thousand transactions. Uh, yeah, so new a thousand new transactions are added uh, in every block, and these transactions basically transfer Bitcoin from one address, from one Bitcoin address to another, you can see that if you sum up all the transfers um, in, this, in this block over here, there were 3,000 Bitcoins transferred in that one particular block. 3,000 Bitcoins with today's value translates to about, uh, what is it, about um, $7 million. So you can see just in those, uh, in that one particular block that was added in a 10 minute window, there was $7 million worth of transfers uh, in Bitcoins. Okay. And in fact, uh, there's a really beautiful website called blockchain.com that gives you a lot of information about the Bitcoin uh, blockchain. I actually encourage you to kind of go play with this website and you can kind of see all sorts of statistics about what's happening with a Bitcoin uh, network, the Bitcoin blockchain, and you can see how much money is being transferred, uh, how many blocks are created, and so on. So let's look at one particular transaction. I keep using the word transaction, but I didn't really explain what a transaction is. So let's look at one particular transaction in one of the blocks that we just saw. Yeah, so I picked on block number um, 540856. That's one of the blocks we saw before. Um, what we see here basically in this block is one particular transaction. So let me explain what this transaction is. So here we see two different uh, Bitcoin accounts, if you like, or what are called Bitcoin addresses. Again, we'll see what addresses are in just a minute. But essentially, two Bitcoin accounts are contributing funds to this transaction. And those funds are going to two other accounts, which are specified here. Yeah. So these are called the two input addresses. These are called the two output addresses. Uh, and what we're seeing basically is that one address received, you know, this amount of Bitcoin, 0 0.006 and so on. And the other address received this amount of Bitcoin, 0 0.017 and so on. Yeah, so the total input is, you know, this amount. The total output is this amount. And the difference between the input and the output is what's called a transaction fee. Okay, so somebody gets to keep this fee. Um, and the person that gets to keep this fee is what we call the miner that actually added this transaction into a block, which was then added to the blockchain. Okay, so we'll talk about how miners operate later on in the lecture. Okay, so one miner basically took this transaction from the user, uh, embedded it in the block, and then published the block to the blockchain, and that miner was compensated uh, for that effort by these particular transaction fees, as well as some other fees that, again, we'll see in, a, in just a little bit. Okay, so from every transaction that was embedded in the block, the miner got to collect some fees. So if there are a thousand transactions embedded in the block, the miner gets to collect, you know, a thousand uh, fees, one from each of these transactions. Um, and I want to kind of emphasize again, this is a, I'll repeat the slide. I want to emphasize again that the blockchain itself is replicated across lots and lots of parties. I want you to remember this terminology that uh, the miners are the one who writes to the blockchain. The end users kind of monitor their own state in the blockchain and the service providers basically process data on the blockchain to kind of understand uh, what's going on in the system. Everyone can validate transactions on the blockchain and uh, invalid blocks are immediately blocked, uh, immediately dropped and um, everyone basically agrees on the same data that's, uh, that's actually placed on the blockchain. Okay, now, some of these things may be a little opaque at this point, but I promise by the end of the lecture, everything will be completely clear. 